All right. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to Genesis chapter 2. We'll start in verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the very first marriage that ever happened. Uh, and not just because it's kind of an interesting historical event. Ooh, look at that. It's the first time somebody did something. It's interesting because it lays the groundwork and it sets the example for what marriages are supposed to be. Um, and understanding that not everybody is slated for marriage in life, and that's an okay thing. Uh, this is not addressing singleness. Okay, the main thing that this addresses is marriage. Now, that doesn't mean this doesn't have anything to say to those who are single. Because even if you are single, you ought to know what a marriage should look like. And there is also the reality that in the Word of God, we are told, for example, in Ephesians chapter 5, that the relationship between a husband and the wife is actually a living, breathing parable of the relationship between Christ and His church. So there's another good reason for people who are single to know what a, a marriage looks like, because that way you have a, a, at least a beginning understanding of what it means to be a Christian in relationship to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're not going to get into very much of that today, but we're going to focus on the first marriage and how that sort of sets the stage or sets the example and understanding for what marriages are supposed to be. So we begin with this. God's work of creating man was not complete until he created woman and instituted marriage to unify them. So God's work of creating man was not complete until God also created woman and then instituted marriage to unify them. Right? So that's going to be our, our basic underlying idea as we approach this scripture today. If you're following along in your sermon notes, your first fill in the blank is this. God created man and woman to be, and i got three C words for you here. Complementary, covenantal companions. God created man and woman in marriage is the implication. To be complementary covenantal companions. So we're going to walk through kind of a lot of these ideas and concepts and explain them as we go through the text of Scripture. So our first part of the text is going to be Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. We'll read verses 18 through 20. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit or suitable for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all of the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So we begin with this really fascinating little thing that God says to begin with. It is not good that the man should be alone. So I want, to, I want us to take a, a kind of a brief pause here and realize where this statement comes in relationship to the rest of the, the early chapters of the book of Genesis. So you have Genesis chapter 1 where we have the creation account. Genesis chapter 2, which we started last week, has sort of a restatement of some of those creation events, but it zeroes in predominantly on the creation of man and woman. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we have what? What happens in Genesis chapter 3? Somebody tell me. The fall. The curse of sin fall comes and it goes sideways. Right? Stuff is not as it should be. This statement is the first time in the Bible anything is called not good. And it's fascinating to me at least that it happens before the fall. 
It happens before the fall that something is actually called not good. Now, that does not mean we hear the word good and we think then of the opposite being what? What's the opposite of good? Bad, yeah. Ha <laughs> ha, tricked ya. No, the opposite of good is not bad. The opposite of good is not good. Bad is a form of not good, but it is not the entirety of what not good is, especially in context of what we're seeing here. Because when God creates something on all of those days of creation, right, if you go back to chapter one, whenever we get to the end point of one of the days, God looked at what he made and he saw that it was good. And we talked about that good being satisfactory. Okay? So what, what it, God says, it, it, when it says God looked at the man, and it was just the man, and he said it is not good for the man to be alone. The, the idea that's present here is that God isn't satisfied. He's like, I'm not done yet. It's not that it's corrupt. It's not that it's bad. It's just not finished. <laughs> It's not good that the man should be alone. There's actually a very uh, interesting story in the uh, book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 18, Moses has led the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay, we're, all, we're already done with the plagues and stuff like that. And we're at Mount Sinai and everything is coming together. And they've uh, got all this stuff going on. And Moses is trying to adjudicate the entire nation just by himself. He's trying to be the one who makes all of the decisions. Decisions because God is the one who called him to lead the people out of Israel or out of Egypt. And he says, all right, well, I guess I'm in charge here. And then it takes his father-in-law, Jethro, to come up to him in Genesis chapter 18, or Exodus rather, chapter 18. And what he says is, Moses, what you are doing is, and here's the quote, not good. What you're doing is not good. You can't complete this task. You can't do this task to a satisfactory nature all by yourself. So what his father-in-law then recommends that he do is he finds a bunch of sub-leaders who will, who will kind of adjudicate over groups of hundreds and fifties and so on and so forth, different groups. So he says, you need helpers. You need people to come along and assist because you cannot do this by yourself. And the same basic idea is present in Genesis. Because God has given Adam a role and he's given Adam a task. And that task is to take dominion over the earth and over all of the living creatures. Now, Adam is one man. Right? He's just one guy. That seems like a big task for just one guy. So when God looks at Adam and it's just Adam and he says that it's not good for the man to be alone. He's saying it's not satisfactory. It's not enough. You can't do this yourself. You have to have a partner. You have to have somebody who will be with you to do this because you are not capable of doing this on your own. Adam, man, you're not enough. You're not enough. So he says, what I'm going to do is I will make a helper fit for you or suitable for you. I will make you a helper who is suitable to come alongside you and make it so that your burden is lightened because they're going to take up part of the work too, right? Now, what's fascinating here is that we have a very small, easy to miss linguistic detail. So let's go back here. In Genesis chapter 1, when God decides or when God announces that he's going to create humanity, how does the text express that? Somebody can, can, can somebody quote it for me? How does God say that? God created man in his image. In the image before of that, before that, back up. Let us make man. What? Let what make man? Us. Let us make man. It's, the, it's, a, it's kind of a plural, of, a, a, a majestic plural, right? Here, he uses the singular. I will make a helper 
suitable for him. So there's, uh, there's a, a, a suspicion here between a lot of the scholars that this may be a, this is special even compared to the creation of man. Now the creation of man is a special thing because man is the one who is above all the rest of the creation. Man is the one who is going to have dominion, rule, right? Now that was a special thing. Man is God's special creation and there appears to be then an even more special thing afoot. Ladies, where's the girl power here this morning, right? There's something good afoot here and God is doing something very unique. And as a matter of fact, the whole creation of woman is unique in how God creates as compared to anything else he makes. And we'll explore that in a little bit. So I will make a helper. Now this, is, this word helper is where some people get a little bit hung up. Because you hear the word helper and you almost hear a condescension happening. But that's not what's going on. Right? This is not, oh, you're such a good little helper, pat on the head. This is a helper that is a partner, that is one who has immense contribution to what is going on with the person that is being helped. The helper supplies support and is not in any way lesser. They have the same value, but different functions to the man and the woman. The same value, the same essential worth as human beings created in the image and likeness of God, but they do have different functions. So man and woman are what you would call complementary. They are not the same, but they have complementing functions for one another. And we will see that get expressed throughout this text as we go along. So he says, it is not good that the man should be alone, so I will make a helper fit or suitable. The focus is on here the equality of man and woman in terms of their humanity, and then the corresponding blessing of God that we read about, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 28. Right? The, the blessing of man, the blessing of humanity is what? Be fruitful and multiply. You, you will flourish, you will grow, you will spread, and you will do that together. You will do that together. You will do this because you, are, you fit with one another. You are suitable for one another. This is not one thing where one is far more important than the other. There is, a, there, there is an agreement of value, worth, and dignity between these two created beings, this man and this woman. They may have different functions, but they are of a, a suitable, together kind of relationship. They belong together, and they don't cancel each other out, but instead they complement one another. See, if it were strictly egalitarian, if it were strictly, uh, they're essentially both the same, one would have the possibility of canceling the other out. But they're not that way. God didn't make them that way. I don't know if you've ever picked up on this. Men and women are different. Yeah, see, <laughs> we, we know this by this point pretty instinctively. Because how many times, guys, have you been like, whoa, 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 what's going on in that head? And women, how many times have you been like, why doesn't he just? Because we ha have been given difference, and, th and that difference is supposed to be complementary, although with the fall and the curse of sin and all that sort of stuff, it doesn't always work out that way so well. But the reality is that the differences that are installed in man and in woman are designed by God to complement one another and to fit together so that we can accomplish the task God gave to us together. And that's the reality behind the creation of man and woman. So we've got this episode the beginning of this episode, at least, where it says, all right, God says it's not good for the man to be alone, so I will make a helper suitable or fit for him. And then what happens is that God parades all of these animals in front of Adam. And it feels like a little bit of a left turn, right? Like, 
why the naming of the animals? Why this parade of these creatures? What is going on there? The naming of the animals is to, there to demonstrate man's need for one of his own kind. One of the things that we've already said when we were looking at the creation of the animals is that there's this word kind, and it's a giant and important word in the creation narrative because it's a word of distinction and distinguishment between the different things that are made and that they don't cross over with one another. So with man, he's given this special task. He's given this special capability of reasoning. He's given this special eternality of spirit that is not shared by the rest of creation. And when God parades these animals in front of him for him to name them, the point of that is to demonstrate or to illustrate that there is nothing in the creation like him. There's nothing that exists that would be compatible with man. You, know, you bring along this gorilla. Nope, not the same. Right, bring along an elephant. Please no. Right, br bring along you know, whatever animal you can think of, and not one of them will be fit. Huh? Platypus. platypus. My favorite animal, the platypus. Because it's a mammal with a duck bill that's aquatic that lays eggs. And as the male has poisonous barbs in his back legs. He's like, eh, we'll put these together. Yeah, evolution, what are you going to do with that? It doesn't make any sense. Right? It's... And it nurses them, so it hatches them, it nurses them. It's like, this is totally outside the bounds of what we expect of the animal kingdom. But the point of all of that is that there's nothing that quite matches man. As special as the platypus is, they're not as unique as man. And that's where we transition to the next point. Number two, God's unique method of creating the woman from man characterizes their relationship as delightful, unified, and sacred. Delightful, unified, and sacred. And I know that there are some married folks in the room who will go, I don't always feel all of those at once. <laughs> That's the effect of sin and the fall and all of that sort of stuff. But the design that that which God instituted, that which God created, which he ordained, which he designed, which he installed, is this. That's what the relationship between the married man and the wife to whom he is married. That's what it is designed to be like. And we'll, we'll look at uh, the text here and we'll draw that out. So Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. We'll stop there. We'll come back to the rest of it in a little bit here. So, first is the bit about the sleep. So, no suitable helper is found. No fit helper for Adam is found, right? None of the animals, platypus included, none of them are going to come even close to what the man needs as a, uh, a, a complementary covenantal companion. So, what does he have to do? Well, he has to make something else, right? He doesn't make like space alien, right? He doesn't make a completely other unique species. He has to make one of the same kind. But what's fascinating is how he does that, right? So the first thing that he does is he puts Adam to sleep. Why does he put Adam to sleep? Now, our modern head 
familiar with modern medicine says, God's being an anesthesiologist. <laughs> right? But let's stop right there for a second. Let me ask you this question. Do you not think that if God wanted, he could have sustained Adam awake and completely without pain during this process? Yeah, of course he could have. So why does he put Adam to sleep? What is going on with that? So part of it has to do with it being the, the whole of the process being kept a mystery to Adam. Adam is not even a conscious spectator for this. This is all the work of God. The only thing Adam contributes, he contributes part of his body, but that's because that was God's idea. And God made the body. So that's the work of God. The, t the putting Adam to sleep and pulling the rib out is there for a couple of reasons. The first reason is to preserve that mystery. So um, there's an old tradition, uh, an old wedding tradition, right? Where the, the groom should not what the bride before the wedding, should not see the bride before the wedding. That actually probably in some ways derives from this, right? Uh, it sort of became corrupted over time into its bad luck for the groom to see the bride before the wedding. I'm not a believer in luck, so that's not what's going on here. But there is an image here of the mystery of this thing being preserved. And there's also the fact that it is totally and completely the work of God. Adam isn't even conscious. So that when the woman is then brought to the man... There is this surprise. There is this delight. Right? When he first, this is the, the proverbial love at first sight. I know, I know that's not like there was a lot of options. Right? But God knows what he's doing. And when he made Eve, he made her perfectly for Adam. It wasn't like Adam said, well, she's all right. Yeah, right? There's an old joke. It's a terrible joke, but I'm going to repeat it. Where God said to Adam, all right, I'm good. Yeah, obviously you need somebody to help because <laughs> you can't do this on your own. So I'm going to make a woman and she's going to be wonderful. She's going to be perfect. She's going to be completely obedient. She'll do everything that you ask and she'll, she'll be exactly what it is that you would dream of. And Adam said, that's amazing. What will that cost me? And God said, an arm and a leg. And Adam said, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> right. That's a, like I said, it's a terrible joke. It's kind of funny, though. So, just thought I'd share that with you. My roommate from college shared that with me years ago, and it's just been rattling around in my brain. Rattling might be the right word. Uh, <laughs> But the, the idea here is that when, when the woman is then going to be presented to the man, he has not seen her, he has no idea, he doesn't know what to expect, and he's totally dependent on God, in God's wisdom, to bring to him that which is fit for him, suitable for him, perfect for him, just right for him. And that when she is brought to him, she is a delight to him. Have you ever seen a groom on the wedding day when he first sees his bride? And the, the smile, the light up, right? It's that times about a thousand. This is delight as it should be. So he puts Adam to sleep. Then there's the surgery, if you will. God uses a portion of the man to form the woman, not dirt like God used in the creation of the man. Do you notice that? It's different. He, he creates woman differently than he creates man. The point here is that they are the same substance. And the goal of their marriage is loving unity. So there's the delight aspect and then there's the unity aspect. So when we were going through our own marriage counseling, we, my uncle, uh, my dad's brother, who was actually the one doing our marriage counseling a little bit, and one of, the, one of the things that sticks out in my mind is that the first thing you have to understand about marriage is that the goal of marriage is oneness. 
the goal of marriage is oneness. And the language of the text here, and as we will go along, indicates that, is that the point is that there's a togetherness, there's such a unity that these things should not be separable, right? In the words of our Lord, what, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Right? That's what marriage should be. It should be unified. Uh, so it's a portion of the man. So your English text tells you it is a rib. Right? That's probably a good translation. Um, the other good translation is simply side. So the Hebrew language is a little bit different than English. We have lots and lots and lots and lots of technical terms, like hundreds of thousands more technical terms than the Hebrew language has. So the Hebrew language, the words can tend sometimes to do double, triple, quadruple, sometimes even more duty than what our typical English word will do. So the word rib here is probably actually a subtle expression of sacred space. How is that possible? What do you mean by that? Well, the word that gets translated rib here shows up in the text of the Hebrew Bible 39 times. 19 of those are in reference to the tabernacle, the sides of the tabernacle. A few more of them are in reference to the temple that Solomon builds. And then even a more that a few more of them are in reference to the temple that is the new temple that's in Ezekiel's vision. So the dominating overuse of or the use of the word in the Old Testament has to do with the sacred space. Now, that's sort of telling. But what's even more telling than that is when you actually begin to observe the structures of the tabernacle and the temple because they use use garden imagery throughout. That's the, the picture of what we find in the temple is that it's sacred space, but it's expressed in terms of a garden. And where are Adam and Eve placed? Garden. The garden. So the expression here is that what God uses to create the woman from the man expresses sacredness. So it's not just an interesting functional relationship. It's a sacred relationship. It's a sacred covenant that binds the man and the woman together in marriage. This is not just an interesting legal contract. It is a legal contract, but it is a sacred, a spiritual contract as well. It is more than just legal words. Though it does include that idea, it is actually also transcendent. What we participate in, men and women, when we marry, is holy by its nature. It is sacred by its nature, which should give us even more pause than normal before entering into marriage. Right? Normally it's like, well, this is kind of a big deal. I'm kind of agreeing to be with this person legally for the rest of my life or the rest of theirs, whichever one doesn't kill each other first. Sometimes feels that way. But it's more than that. It is, this is not just a bond between man and woman. This is a bond between man, woman, and God. God is in this mix. God is in this. We must be very wise then about our approach, about our attitude towards marriage. Because it is deeply important and it has reverberations not just in the physical realm two people living together in the same space potentially producing children not just in the legal realm we have to do taxes together every year but in the spiritual realm the realm of the activity of our god not that he isn't active in the physical realm and the legal realm also 
but the, the, the domain that is exclusive domain that we have no say over whatsoever. God is in this mix. This is very important. Number three, the first marriage exemplifies God's standards for all marriages. So what happens after the surgery and the creation, the formation of the woman is the first wedding. It's the first marriage. What we're about to read is a wedding ceremony. <coughs> Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. So God brings the, the uh, woman to the man. Then the man said, and this is a little bit like a wedding vow that we're reading here. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So there's this initial statement at last. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So there's a few things that's going on in this text. The first is the kind of the obvious surface level. Um, she's taken from me. She's made from me. We are of the same kind because we're of the same substance. My bone, my flesh were taken to form her. So there's that level of things. And that's the fairly obvious level. But there's an additional level that should be noted here. And we come back to the complementary idea that man and woman are not the same. So if you take the flesh idea, the concept of the flesh, that your skin, right? You go ahead and pinch yourself a little bit, not too hard. I don't want anybody to yelp. Soft, malleable. Now, take your hand, whichever hand, wrap it around, and try to bend your arm in ways that it can't bend. You can't, why not? Hopefully, unless you're really strong and you shouldn't be doing that, because you've got bone there, and bone is hard. There's the flesh, which is soft, which is malleable, which is in some way um, responsive. And then there's bone, which is hard, which is rigid, which is unmoving. So the picture of flesh here is a picture of that which is somewhat weak. And the picture of bone is that which is somewhat strong. And, and so the, the statement, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh made by Adam, actually has potentially at least carries this concept of where I am weak, you are strong. Where you are weak, I am strong. Where I'm flesh, you're bone. Where you're flesh, I'm bone. We are complementary to one another. So that was the whole point of this project to begin with. When God looked at Adam, he said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit or suitable for him. I'm going to create somebody who's going to help him in ways to do things that he can't do himself. Somebody who's strong where he's weak and someone who is weak where he's strong because they're going to be complementary to one another. And that's what's going on in this image of flesh and bone. So that's the, the, the kind of the statement of the disposition of man and woman in their marriage. But then there is this activity that is mentioned. The man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The closest human allegiance within a marriage is the spouse. It is not the family of origin. Here's what will sometimes happen that will trip up a marriage. A man and a woman, they get married. And then the friction starts. And then, well, that's not the way my mom used to make it. Well, that's not how my dad used to. 
And we begin appealing outside of this thing that's called the marriage. That is not how it works. Now, there's always space for, you know, we're having trouble figuring this out. Maybe we should go talk to somebody who has experience. Moms and dads have experience in this. We can appeal to them and say, hey, how did you guys together, how did you guys do this? And, and seek advice. But they're not in charge of your marriage. Mom and dad on one side, mom and dad on the other, if you're blessed to have that, are not in control of your marriage. God is. Because he designed it to work differently than that. He designed it so that the man will leave his father and mother. There's an there's a idea that's present here in the text because the idea of a family unit, man, a woman, the children they have, the children are underneath the covenantal head of authority of their father. But when a man goes to get married, the child grows up, he leaves the covenantal authority of his father. He will leave his father and his mother and hold fast or be united to his wife. Because now the, the child that has grown up and has left that family to get married, that man has just become the new covenantal head of a new family. That's what is supposed to happen. That is how it is supposed to work. And yes, of course, you can point out to me all of the different variations and all of the ways that that has gone wrong in history. It does not change the fact that this is the way God established it for, for it to work. If you are a knucklehead and you screw this up, it says nothing about the way that God established it. The problem isn't with God's design. The problem is because you're a moron. If you can point out to me a man who is bullish and abusive, he needs to be knocked down. He needs to be corrected. It doesn't mean that the system is the problem. If you can point out to me a woman who is bullish and controlling and a problem in the world, it doesn't mean that God's design is the problem. It means she is. And she needs to be knocked down and corrected. So let's not then start listening to the lies of our culture that will tell us, no, it needs to be completely egalitarian and not complementary. It needs to be that there is no covenant head of this family. That's not how God designed it. We do what God said, not what our culture tells us. I don't care how many screw-ups there are in the world. God isn't one of them. God is not one of them. We listen to him even when we mess up. This is part of becoming an adult Leave your father and mother, be united to your spouse. Hold fast to your spouse. Work on that. And if something tries to come in from the outside and meddle, you close the door on it. Whether it's somebody trying to come in and be a substitute spouse, whether it's a parent coming in and trying to parent when their parenting role is done. You close the door on that and you say, thank you for your advice. We're doing it this way. If we want your opinion, we'll come and ask you and that's okay to do. But mom and dad, you are not in charge. You are not in control. You are not in control anymore. Lastly, they were naked and not ashamed. They were naked and not ashamed. The consummating expression of marital intimacy is, of course, the practice, practice of sexual union in accordance with God's design for marriage. Which means one man, one woman. 
in covenantal union, sacred covenantal union with one another till death. That's God's design for marriage. Any variation or aberration on that is sinful and offensive to God. Period. End of discussion. I don't care how many feelings it hurts out there or even in a year. If you've come today and you have a different opinion on that, I'm sorry that you're wrong and that you're against what God has very clearly said in his word. But you get to repent and change. God isn't going to. Okay? God is the one who designed this thing. We don't get to come in and reinvent it. We don't get to subtract one and add another. We don't get to leave both and then add another. We don't get to add things that aren't human to this mix because people try that too. And it is against what God has ordained. What God has ordained is good and anything else is not good. And in this case, not good doesn't simply mean not satisfactory, it means sinful. So we say, yes, God, to his ways. We say, yes, God, to his wisdom. And we repudiate that which is against it. We say, no. And it's not like we have to be jerks and bullish. It means we simply say, no. Nope, that's not what God designed. What God designed is this, one man, one woman, together in sacred covenantal union with one another till death do them part. That's what God intends. That's what God has intended, and he has not changed that. There's nowhere in the scriptures where God says, all right, we're shifting on this. There's no shift. And this can be very hard for some people because they know other people who have decided some other way is better. We have to be very, very careful not to fall into the emotional trap of, but I know somebody. I know, we all know somebody who is in sin. Doesn't have to be that sin. We all know somebody who has decided they're going to live apart from the way that God has designed. Doesn't have to be that, but there's sure plenty of that going on. But we don't excuse any other sin through emotional means. Well, I know that he murders, but he's such a nice guy otherwise. If somebody said that to you, you'd be like, you're an idiot. Stop. If somebody said, look, I know she's a thief, but she's so cute, right? You'd be like, dude, get away. Not a good idea. Why do we emotionally excuse this sin or variations on this? Why? Because we're scared of people being mad at us. We're scared at the people that we like being upset with us when we tell them no. But it is better to side with God. It is simply better to side with God. And like I said, you don't have to be a bullish, you don't have to be a jerk, right? You simply have to be truthful and say, no. I know that's what you think, but you're wrong. No. God said this, this is the way it is. That is how we approach any issue in the scriptures. Not just sexuality, but any issue. What has God said? What does the Lord say? Well, if the Lord says, then that's what we do. That's how we live. That's how we believe. That's how we act. So let us do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace to cover our sinfulness. Thank you that you welcome back sinners 
who repent and turn to you. That there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over a legion of people who are getting along well in righteousness. Thank you, God, that we get to be a part of your work in this. Thank you, God, that we get to witness what you are doing in the world. And thank you that we get to express the goodness of your plan and design in marriage, in the sharing of the gospel. And thank you, Father, for the goodness of what you have created in the union of a man and a woman in sacred covenantal companionship that is complementary. We pray, Father, that our hearts would always adjust to you and not seek to get you to adjust to what we would want because it's not the best. You know what is best. You know what is right. May our hearts turn towards your righteousness. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.